गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू सेशन नंबर फिफ्टी वन ऑफ आई सी एफ संडे वेबिनार सीरीज द टॉपिक फॉर टूडे इज रीडेबिलिटी एंड क्लैरिटी इंक्लूडिंग फॉर्मेटिंग एंड लैंग्वेज अवर स्पीकर फॉर टूडे इज क्रिस्टा बैडविन शी एज ट्वेंटी टू ईयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस एडिटिंग फॉर इंडस्ट्री गवर्नमेंट अकेडमिया एंड एजुकेशनल एंड ट्रेड पब्लिशर्स एंड शी स्पेशलाइज इन केमिस्ट्री इंजीनियरिंग एंड द एनवायरमेंट she has contributed chapters to two books that have been brought out by editors canada so the first book is editing canadian english and the second book is editorial nations so over to you krista thank you vivek um okay so i can share my screen now yeah okay i hope that works Are you you're seeing the hang on I have to move the I mute myself there you go Sorry will I fumble around here to get organized Oh and then it went up to there okay Are you seeing it um you're seeing the presentation although not the beginning slide let's go to the beginning slide sorry I think we are seeing the presenter's view um Okay, so we have to see the other way. Mm, yeah. Um, let me unshare then. Let's try this. Now you're seeing a what? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um. So, uh, I am Krista Bedwin, as you have said, and so this is uh. Sort of the first webinar I always do if I'm doing a webinar. I I seem to be doing a lot of webinars these days because I do them at the University of British Columbia, which are also free, uh, free seminars. It's at a bit of a crazy time for India, though. It's noon on Pacific time, so I don't think it's good for you guys. <laughs> But um, the the recordings are also free that you can access. If you go to my web page address here, it's very simple. It's just my name. Uh, dot com. Then you can find uh, these webinars. There's some blogs which I have put some other resources about a few things I will mention in here. If you want to, uh, there, I have some textbooks that I made them very inexpensive that you can buy through there. Um, but the blogs, of course, are free, and the what other webinars through UBC are free. Um, but all of it you can find on my web page. <clears throat> okay, so. These readability tricks apply whether you're in academia or industry, or you're writing for a community, or you're writing a letter to your grandmother. All of these things uh, can be the same. Same tricks. Okay, now, do I know how to change the slide? Yes. So here's some resources I used for this presentation. But wait a minute. There's already a problem with this. Can anybody tell me, or or tell me in the chat, what's the problem with this? It's that it's a wall of text. So instead of having a wall of text, you would be much happier with me if I tell you a bullet point of text. So now you can easily see where I got the information for this webinar. So it, this presentation comes from uh, going to conferences and seminars, uh, English second language publishers. I've done a lot of work with um, educational publishers who are very strict and probably the most polished publishing, I think, for making sure people understand. Um, Plain language advocates, designers, um, and and international travel, I think, also has helped me look at language in different ways. It's always good to learn different languages and try to do some presentations in French. It's interesting; It makes me think a different way about being clear. So, there's also a problem with this slide. Can anybody say what that might be? Which is that I put some acronyms here that maybe not everybody knows what those acronyms are. So that would be Editors Association of Canada. The Alberta magazine publishers. So again, I really find that cross training and like going to the magazine publishers gave me a lot of interesting, different perspectives on on how we can write stuff and how we can present information. Uh, the Editors Association uh, of Europe of science editors and uh, the Mediterranean editors who are really friendly. So when you have a slide or a piece of information. You shouldn't really be having these acronyms without explaining them, and I was kind of putting them there to show you a bad example of what to not do. So here's what we are going to do in this session. So we'll meet the reader. Um, 
then we're going to talk about words. So my main point about making your words readable is to use less words and you'll say more if you use less words. Use fewer words, I should say. Um, but then we'll talk about how to use the space on the page. Um, and then we'll have some worked examples. So I want to leave some time so that people actually try out the quizzes with their pen and paper, because you'll find it more interesting if you do try it. Um, so uh, if we want to have a question period, I can stop 10 minutes before. And if we haven't done all the worked examples by then, we can do them a bit after. Does that work OK, Vivek, if we do it that way? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And we might get through it all. I just, just so that we have a accommodation. So the first important thing for everybody that you speak to about uh, plain language or how to make clear writing is it depends who is your reader. So we need to know how educated are they? What purpose do they have? How motivated are they to read something? Uh, so in the case of industry reports or academic reports, um, sometimes people assume that the person on the end will be forced to read the writing. And so then they don't make very much effort. That's not really great. <laughs> um, then we're going to talk about circumstances and distractions on the next slide. And also the usual reading habits. So someone who, am I, am I speaking too quickly, by the way, or is it okay? It might be good if you can slow down. For the benefit I of will everybody. try to slow it's down. Okay. It's okay, but you can slow down. It would be good. I, I will try, yes. <laughs> I speak quite quickly. You're doing fine. Even, even for a Canadian. Uh, okay, yeah. so... <laughs> You're doing so, just fine. Relax. So speaking of quickly and slowly, uh, yeah. this is a main thing that I try to get people to think about with readability. So if we look at these four different readers, okay, the one on the top right is Hildegard von Bingen. So she was around in the 1100s, uh, one of Europe's most amazing people. She did science, herbology, she wrote music, but she was also managing an entire cloister of nuns. So you can imagine, even though this person is very brilliant, one of the smartest people around, she mm -hmm. was also very busy. And so the more busy you are and the more exhausted you are, the more difficult it is to read. Um, and of course, the guy below her, he has uh, his cell phone, uh, telephones ringing all in his business. Uh, the internet is distracting him. So his reading level, again, you cannot expect him to read a very complicated paper in this environment. Same thing with the people in this uh, kind of very busy office. Noise makes it harder to read. Now, these guys on the bottom corner, they probably could read the best because they're sitting in uh, the old days. There's no internet, no traffic. Uh, they have no responsibilities, no children, no family. They just get some reading or writing from their boss and they go somewhere quiet. So we might think of this being like the academics of the modern day. If they have a quiet office and they just can study. So then we think they can read the most complicated paper. So I don't know if any of you know uh, Chaucer of, of England. So he wrote in the 1200s. And at the time of Chaucer, his sentences, yes, yes. his sentences had, guess how many words Chaucer had in a sentence. Nowadays, we normally have about eight words per sentence in North America. I don't know India, what the average is. But in Chaucer's time, it was 82 words per sentence. Oh. So... <laughs> Obviously, you need a quiet room to read those sentences. Mm -hmm. So now I want you to take your pencil and paper and think for a minute. I want you to actually try to write down this uh, table. So if you have a monk and you have an internet user, what is the difference in these six categories? Just take a minute quietly to try this yourself. Actually try to write down the answers. Why don't you give us a scale, each one? Someone might think one to five, someone will think one to 10. 
Yes, may, yeah, you can do it that way. Uh, for me, I just did it in words, but doing it in a scale would, would also be smart. Okay. So uh, I will give uh, some answers. So the first thing we discussed already the monk, probably high education level. Uh, the purpose is that's all that they do all day, a bit of reading, a bit of gardening. <laughs> They're quite, somebody has their uh, microphone on and it's making traffic sounds or something. Maybe you can turn yeah. into mute. Uh, so the purpose of the monk, I mean, they're very clear on their purpose and motivation. Uh, I imagine some of them were not motivated. I don't know what they did with those guys. They took them somewhere else. Uh, the monk has quiet circumstance, not, dis no, not too many distractions. And he also has the habit of doing this reading all the time. The internet user, if you did this exercise, you probably realize you don't know. You don't know the education level. You don't know really their purpose. You hope they come to your web page for a certain purpose, but you don't really know. Maybe they're coming to your web page to try to steal your brain power or yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're motivated by trying to, you don't, you don't know why they're coming. Uh, you don't know how distracted if they're reading on their telephone or they're reading on their computer. Uh, and you don't know if they're used to reading, say, academic paper or they're used to reading only memes. So if you're writing an internet page, you need to be aware that everybody might read it. And what's your motivation to, to study them? Now, another uh, activity I think is interesting is I used to work in Calgary, Alberta, which is a big oil capital in Canada, the oil capital, I guess, in Canada. So we have many tall office buildings. And the question is, who is the smartest reader in the office building? Is it the CEO? Is it the janitor? Uh, is it the marketer? Uh, try to rank these one to five there. Now you have a ranking exercise. <laughs> so try to rank this on your paper. Who is the best? Who is the worst? Each one has some advantage and some disadvantage about how they are going to read. So I would say you don't know about the janitor. They might be an amazing writer. Normally, we think that the janitor is uh, probably the low person. But in Canada, you know, a lot of very educated doctors and people from other countries end up taking cleaning jobs. And there's always stories of those people who have cleaning jobs, uh, you know, just getting an opportunity and, and going much farther. So we should not assume that they cannot read. Um, the CEO, of course, must be a very smart person. But what is the factor that makes the CEO the, not the best reader is that they, um, of course, are very, very busy. So they're reading way too many things. They have in their head so many projects. And because they have so many projects, just like Hildegard von Bingen there, their reading level is lower. So even though at university they may have been the best person in the class, when they are the chief executive officer of the company, they are not as smart as they were because of their exhaustion. Uh, the new engineer fresh out of university, they are really good at reading university papers, but they might not be the best at reading industry papers because they don't yet have the habit of reading the industry paper. The middle manager or the intermediate level marketing person, they have become specialized into their type of reading. So the marketing person can probably read marketing stuff really quick. They can read the research that they need to find very fast because they have that habit. They can write things very fast. Um, but if you ask them to read something that's outside of their normal habit, it might be more difficult for them. So even though you might not think this applies to your type of writing, it does apply because there are these type of people in all different kinds of writing and reading. So for example, with educational, you have your target students who have a range of reading levels, but there's also their parents. You know, like there's many things to think about on any document. So that's all I have to say about the readers for now. So the part two is, 
how to use words. It's a big topic. So the first thing about how to use words is to understand that our ego does not have to be involved and we all are going to write something at the beginning that we could improve. So that is why we take the editorial step, right? We begin with garbage, then we take some time. If you can wait and sleep on it, or if you can get somebody else to edit, then you're going to be improving the writing. This seems very obvious to editors, but it doesn't always seem obvious to our clients. So I often reassure my clients, you know, everybody has this problem. You don't have to be upset if you get edited. And another thing we have to tell the, re the writers is if you were not understood, then you did not communicate. Okay? So parents do this. Parents say, oh, I told you to do that a hundred times, or I told you that was going to turn out like that. Or, but if the child did not process that the parents, how the parents meant that thing, then the parent did not actually communicate with the child. You know, telling someone and actually communicating with them effectively is not the same strategy. So it's the same thing with our documents. If you can write all the words down, you know, one engineer I interviewed, he says, oh, I was so good at writing words. I wrote so many words. They were great words, but my clients didn't know what they mean. So, you know, it's not really an effective document until you understand where is your reader coming from? What is their circumstance? And how do you reach them? So maybe that means you change your jargon. Maybe you use fewer words. You have to think about it. So here are some words that I often go in uh, when I'm editing English second language writers. And I often delete a lot of these words. So then somebody will always uh, pop up and say, oh, but therefore is a very important word. In some arguments, you do need the word therefore, but with my clients, they often use it when you don't actually require it. So the first thing I do to make something more readable is I go and I delete a lot of these words, depending on the writer, of course, right? Some writers use many of these, some hardly use any. And in my own writing also. So here's a, a wordy phrases game for you. So get your pencil out. Each of these answers should be just one word. See if you can guess them all. I'll give you a minute. Maybe when you're done, you can type done in the chat and then I will know to give the answers. Maybe it seems like a few people are done. So I will give some answers now. So a certain number of is some, a considerable amount of is much. So the funny thing is, uh, in scientific writing also, people for some reason think they will sound smarter if they use the ones on the left hand side. And it's the opposite. <laughs> so instead of saying there were a considerable number of fish, you can say there were many fish. And then your important complicated points will be easier to understand because you're not loading your document with these extra words.
So did everybody have a chance to check their answers now? You don't have to say accounted for by the fact that you can say because but a lot of writers like to say accounted for by the fact that because they think accounted for by the fact that makes them sound more authoritative. So an interesting thing about this uh, garbage phrase uh, game is that there's a web page called, uh, I'll put in the chat here, cewriting.org. And this is some civil engineers who collected, I don't know how many documents, a thousand or, or 2000. And they analyzed beginning writers and experienced engineering writers. And they found the more experienced the writers are, the less likely they are to use accounted for by the fact that, and an example of this is the, so they use much clearer language, more active voice when they have more experience. So the right-hand side is for the writers with experience. The left-hand side is for people who want to seem like they really know what they're doing, but maybe they don't. So step two, use elegant words. So as in fashion, elegant equals simple. So to impress our high school teachers, we learned big complex words. So that's kind of what I was saying before. Um, to impress clients, we want to keep it simple, K-I-S. So again, if you read this slide before I read it, it doesn't impress you that I use an acronym. It doesn't make me look smarter that I use an acronym you don't know. It just makes you confused. So we, it's better to say, keep it simple instead of assume everybody knows K-I-S. So, um, Ele elegant words are better than more words. And so here are some examples. I think utilization is the most common word of my entire career that especially young re writers in, in the university course I'm, I'm teaching now, the young ones are most likely to use utilize instead of use. And I mark it every time because they don't need to make it bigger. So how do we easily change from installation to site or enumerate to list or modification, even to modify is better, right? So we have a method for this. You can use the active voice. And that will bring us fewer words and shorter words. So the passive voice. So if we say the horse was ridden by the man, it's much shorter to say the man rode the horse. So if we said the horse was ridden, we don't know who is riding the horse. And yet so many people write their papers this way. The work was done. The experiments were carried out. You carried out the experiments, just say so. So here's an example of how we can shorten these words. So you can often shorten sentences by taking the extra parts off. So for example, instead of the conclusion was reached, you can write, we concluded. So the other benefit of we concluded is that it makes it accountable. And so in a business context, you are um, inspiring uh, confidence in your clients because you're owning that work instead of just claiming that somebody else did it. Normally, at least in Canada, uh, we claim somebody else did it when we don't want to take liability or any responsibility. So. Uh, Longinated is not a real word. I was using that as a joke. So longinated word is rationalization. You can take off the ization. So yeah, a sentence with rationalization would be something like, he made a rationalization or a rationalization was made, even worse. We can just say the rationale for that decision was much clearer, right? We even took a whole sentence away by doing that. Or we can even say the reason instead of saying rationale. Um, the implementation was made. We can just say we implemented it or we did it even better. So another quiz. And maybe while people are doing this quiz, you just have to write the answer in active voice. So I gave you one example, the contribution to the church lunch was appreciated. So you can imagine somebody sitting down and writing 100 cards that said your contribution to the church lunch was appreciated and they could send it to 100 people and it doesn't mean anything, right? You could say 
thank you for bringing cookies to the church lunch. And then you could even personalize it and show interest in that person. It's a much more authentic thank you. So the other ones, you can give very short answers, however. So your check will be mailed by the accountant. Would be in the active voice, we would just say, the accountant will mail your check. That's only six words then. The budget has been approved by the client. We just say, the client approved the budget. So you also notice this turns the sentence backwards and forwards, which is another thing I often have to do with people who have the habit of writing these backwards sentences. Um, instead of the field work will be done, again, that's the same thing. We don't know who's riding the horse, right? Who is doing the field work? We want to say, our subcontractor will do the field work. We will do the field work. We want to know. Does anybody have any questions at this point? I can take a question or two if somebody wants to ask one. Or you can ask your questions also in the chat and then I will, I will take a break and answer them. If, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Okay, now we're in the very gloomy and sad part of the presentation, which is jargon. Jargon makes me very gloomy. I put this cloud here to show you that jargon makes a cloud. Okay, so if you use jargon, it's like you're at a cocktail party and everybody in your research group or everybody in your marketing group is huddled and their shoulders are to the back of the party and nobody can talk to you. You have this secret language. Okay, so if you want to actually join with other human beings, then you have to open your shoulders to the rest of the party and you, you explain yourself. So you facilitate fast technical communication maybe with your jargon, with your little group, um, makes you feel like a small family. But if you want to communicate with other people, you have to, you know, offer some other people a smile. And the way that we do that is to explain our jargon. Um, so the, this is just me again saying this is, the, the acronyms and the jargon, they block the communication, just like I showed you a couple of times already in this, in this presentation. Acronym is just something you don't know what it means. So it's not helpful. Yes, three letter acronym somebody put. <laughs> so I don't want to see jargon. And so the way to get rid of jargon is just to fix it. Okay, we can explain it. So here's another quiz here. So when we first draft our thoughts, particularly with complex substances, subjects, we often repeat ourselves. That's fine. It's normal to repeat yourselves when you first draft your thoughts. Edit to clarify. Use structure and signposting to clearly mark important ideas. Reports are not speeches and clarity trumps repetition. That word trumps is uh, more terrible than when I first wrote this presentation. <laughs> but uh, there's two pieces of jargon. If we count trumps also, because trumps means a certain word, but we could use a different word to explain this better. So maybe somebody can put, what is, what's the jargon word in the chat? Okay, I ask you to use a method here that I don't really explain what the method is. I just use a word to explain this method. You might be able to figure it out, but you don't actually know. Yes, Vivek got it. So instead of saying signposting, which is a great word, but you don't know what it means, then let's use it instead in words that everybody would understand. So clear, concise structure in plain language. So first drafts have too many words, edit to clarify, reduce repetition, add paragraph breaks. And then headings and clear structure are better than repetition. So this is also fewer words, then the last one, quite a lot fewer words, you see? And also doesn't have a cloud now. <laughs> so signposting means just making headings so that it's like you have a roadmap. It's like, it's like I like to think a document is like you're going down a country lane and you see a signpost here and you know where you are and then you go to the next signpost and you know where you're going and you can see uh, in the... If you look at the table of contents, then you see a long uh, list of all the signposts that you're going to find in the document. And that's good. That's a very comfortable way to have a document. <clears throat> so murder acronyms. So again, I already gave you the answer for this. 
uh, to impress clients, KIS. Well, that's really stupid to write it this way. I even look at it, it makes me feel itchy. You don't have to do it that way. So murder the acronyms, their jargon. So the rules for acronyms are you eliminate. So I also like to eliminate them. A lot of uh, writers will write an acronym and they won't even use it again. So the rule when I work at a company is they have to use at least three more times. And if they don't use it three more times, we're, we're going to spell out the word anyway. Um, they need to be defined at first use. And there is an amazing tool for making an acronym list, which you may be familiar with <laughs> if you were here last week. So for a long time, I have also been recommending perfect it to people because if you are working in a company that has acronym lists in reports, that's already saving 10 or 12 hours from the secretaries to do that. Uh, and Vivek's telling us there's still a discount until April 30th for, for Perfect It. Even if you just try the free one, I mean, it, it, has, it, it pays for itself if you have the kind of work that you need to do that kind of thing. Nowadays, I don't do the kind of work that uses it as much, but it's, it's a nice program. Okay, so I said acronyms should be murdered, but there's some cases where they are okay. So if you're thoughtful about it, and if the acronyms makes the text easier to understand, which sometimes can happen, um, but don't put them in because you think it makes you look smart, which is, again, mm -hmm. something that young writers often think if they put more acronyms, they look more, uh, have more authority. It, it doesn't. So in this paragraph here with steam assisted gravity drainage, that's saving us four words, which is a lot. And it's changing, saving us 12 words in this paragraph. Another thing is that SAG D is a very common term in that industry. But even if that's a very common term, I still want it to be spelled out the first time. Cannot skip it. And luckily perfect, it would check that. Very good if you have to edit industry stuff. Okay, that's all I have to say for today about how to use words. Now we're going to talk about some formatting and space on the page. Again, if you have chat questions at any time, you can put them in the chat. I used to teach high school and you will not make me nervous by asking me questions. It's okay. <laughs> so, uh, step five, signposting. So now I told you what signposting is. I'm going to use it because it is a good method, especially for readability. And this is also something in educational writing you know, the more that your reader knows where they are and where they're going. So in, in textbooks for school, you tell the kids what you're about to teach them. That makes it much more effective lesson. Okay. So clear headings make for readable content. And so another thing, which is a modern aspect and also applies to academic writing is documents that read like web pages are better than the old fashioned paragraph after paragraph after paragraph reports or letters. We can, we can make headings. And sometimes I run into people and they think, oh, it's not allowed. <laughs> yes, it's allowed. Mm -hmm. You know, who's going to tell you you're not allowed to make this, to put in some white space? Um, when we used to print everything on paper, yeah, you had to save the paper. But now you don't have to save paper. You know, if you do have to design the web page so people don't scroll, but you can design it that they flip the page. I mean, you, you don't have to squash everything into a small area. It's it's not desirable. So think visual instead of just thinking about the words. So when I, when I put add some spice, I mean like add some spice. Think about not just making black and white. In fact, before this presentation, we were talking about black and white and, and color. You know, there's no reason to make things boring looking. So... Sometimes you can use a table or a bulleted list, or you can just put something in a different space on the page. It wakes people up. It's really good to keep people awake when they're reading your stuff. So quiz, how could you think visual about this? And if you think visual about this email, you're going to make it so much more effective. This kind of email is the kind, uh, when I worked at a company, that the engineer will come back and say, oh, the, the client never answers my emails. Yeah, no wonder the client never answers your emails. Look at this thing. It's hard to answer, isn't it?
Two people said bullets. I have a better answer than bullets even. A list with numbers is good, yes. So there's a few things more than just lists with numbers. So I choose numbers instead of bullets here. And why? Because if this is a client relationship, you might want to pick up the telephone and discuss it. And you might want to say item number two. And if you made it a bulleted list, they can't see which one is item number two. And you might think that's not a big deal with um, three bullets, but I did actually receive something from a colleague on Friday that had like 12 bullets. So if you want to discuss something, it's better to number it. So another thing is that I put the subject header. So a big sin that I think we have all done by accident, but causes a lot of difficulty at work, is that people don't change the subject header on their emails. Um, another thing on the last email, the guy did not actually say hello. Just went Eric, which is abrupt. It's much You'll get much better answers if you say hello. You'll also get much better answers if you say thank you, I think. I like thank you as an ending. Um, and then, just to be considerate, let's give him the phone number and the email so that he doesn't have to go looking for it, okay? Make things easier for your correspondents. Give them the gift of time. You put in the time, they don't have to put in the time, you're gonna have a better relationship. And they're gonna give you three answers. On that previous email, they would give you one answer or two answers because their brain doesn't even see that you wanted three answers. This one, it's really obvious. They want three answers. So here's another way to think visual. So uh, steam assisted gravity drainage again. <laughs> so this one is from a, an, an actual oil company, I think from 2001 or something. But if I was to tell you those seven paragraphs, uh, it would be very boring reading and it would be difficult reading because you would have to create the picture in your brain of how the technology works. It's not really fun. But when you have a picture, all of a sudden this is quite fun, okay? Number one, we will drill two horizontal wells and your eye automatically goes and looks for the two horizontal wells. It's like a kid's book. It's exciting. You want to engage with it because there is an image. So. If you can, don't say, oh, I'm not allowed to make a picture. Yes, you're allowed to make a picture, you know, try it. Even uh, in academic uh, grant proposals, you know, people say, oh, you're allowed five pages of words. You, you, that means five pages and you can make some of those words into a picture and it's much more effective and fun for the person who has to read it, which means they're more likely to give you the grant. So if you make the grant proposal less miserable to read, you have a higher chance of success. So other good places, uh, explaining a new technology. Um, so case studies, for example, um, maps and diagrams, which again, if you can put it in, definitely. Um, procedures. So an example of a procedure, I think of like safety procedure in the field. Um, if somebody has to do 21 checkpoints for a pickup truck that they're renting in, in the field, then why not use a picture of a pickup truck, which will also take one page and just use bubble points to show, here's what you have to check on the tires, here's what you have to check on the engine, here's what you have to check on the seatbelt. Uh, it's much more doable and then they can actually check it off. Uh, relationships between people, of course, org charts, if you're in the management realm. Uh, much better to use a diagram than just a list. Step number seven, readable fonts. So I think we all use some unreadable fonts in our youth because there are a lot of enjoyable fonts that Word will give you to play with. And PowerPoint is also a really big, terrible sinner that will allow us to make a lot of terrible mistakes with the color choices. So professionally, Arial, Calibri, and Times New Roman are always going to be acceptable. If you have a designer, they may offer you something else. And I also, dyslexia font is a very interesting one to look at. So I had to take a screenshot of it because you have to buy it to be able to get it. 
but so this dyslexia font um, helps people with dyslexia to have less difficulty with switching the letters and stuff. And it also, if you buy that dyslexia font, it also gives you some read back strategies and some other help for people with dyslexia. But I think it would be a good industry standard for us all to adopt. Really, it's a pretty good font. Not a good idea to use ornate fonts, bold fonts, or scripty fonts. Although I want to admit right now that sometimes I do, just for fun. But <laughs> try not to do it in a professional mm -hmm. context. I even made a small novel and I put it in a ridiculous font. I, I don't know why. Amazon lets you do anything. You can just get them printed that way. <laughs> but you shouldn't really, not if you want to sell them. Um, okay, so this is also a very interesting slide about serif font and sans serif fonts. Uh, so, oh, and I'm very sorry, when I switched this slide over to this thing, it took my serif font away But in the, in the heading. But you can see in the bottom here, so modern, clean, and approachable fonts, those brand names want to be seen as modern people, right? Brands that want to look like they're traditional and established and trustworthy, they use the more old-fashioned kind of serif font, the first ones to come out when the printing presses came out. There's, there's plenty of research to find on this on the internet if you want to look at it. It's more of a design factor. So step number eight is line spacing. So readability is affected by fonts, colors, and line spacing. And thanks to the internet, people are now used to typical reading line space of 1.15 and a space between paragraphs. So you're kind of seeing that here. Um, it used to be that people would always want everything double spaced, which I don't find that readable. I find it kind of awkward. And so here we have an example. Um, this is an excerpt by another really excellent free book, The Subtleties of Scientific Style. I, I love this guy. So he made his book free. The web address is at the bottom there. By the way, if you miss anything here, Vivek is going to post the recording so you could go to YouTube and then pause it on the slide. Um, but so here we show the example of the old fashioned way on the left, which was double space everything. And then the one on the right. And so the one on the right is showing us how we read web pages also, and how we almost all now read because of reading the internet, which is what you actually do is you go here, we have all read sentences like, but it is thought and it is concluded and they allow the author. So what we do is we read the first line of every paragraph. Then we, so that gives us a little structure. Then we go back in and read the paragraphs. So if I do that in the case of this right, uh, the left-hand one, I have nothing to hang on to. But because the format, and I exaggerated slightly the spacing and paragraph, but this is more like the format we now do. Um, so we, we normally read that first line of each paragraph. This is also why when you're editing scientific research or any dense heavy business document, you need to find the most important points and make sure they're at the beginning of a paragraph because the white space is the emphasis in documents now. Okay? The white space is what leads my eye to those important words. And a funny thing about authors is that they often put their most important idea in the middle of a paragraph <laughs> buried in all these other words because their high school teacher told them they should do that maybe. So, or they don't realize they did it. So you need to, as the editor, we need to find those important points and we need to make sure they're at the beginning of the paragraphs. So now here's another example. How many things do you think this paragraph asks you to do? If I ask you that question now, you're editors, so you're rushing through there trying to look. But if I made a bulleted list, how many things do I ask you to do? Four things, right? This is how reading should be. I should say, how many things? Four things. You should not have to read something like that wall of text. So this is repeating what I just said. You, you may start with the garbage on, the, on that last page. In fact, it's not even garbage. This is the same word. But as you get organized, go back and make sure each sentence has one idea. Some authors, I'm sure you know, give us two or three ideas per sentence. Make sure there's one. Make sure the important ideas are at the front or back of the paragraph. 
parallel ideas should be in bulleted lists instead of just in paragraphs. Uh, and like ideas are grouped together. So sometimes we have to rearrange documents to make sure. Um, I didn't speak uh, in this presentation, but another thing I often do is I go look for semicolons and turn that into two sentences, into two sentences. And that's because of those monks that we were talking about. The semicolons and the long sentences is okay if you're a monk and you have quiet, but if you're dealing with people reading in distraction circumstances or they're exhausted, it takes less calories on your brain to read a sentence that has a period at the end. Your brain sort of packages up something when it has a capital letter and a period, then it has a package, then it goes to the next idea and makes a little package. So it's easier on your brain to read those shorter sentences instead of the long ones with the semicolon. Oh, it may be because people used to indent the start of paragraphs. Yeah, we use a line space now instead of um, indenting the paragraph. It's true. It's also a design choice. I kind of miss indenting paragraphs. Um, so which one of these is easier to read? Now, it's a bit tricky because the first one ends up being shorter. But what I was trying to show here is that narrower columns are easier to read. That's why newspapers and magazines use narrow columns. If you just have everything from margin to margin in a, in a newspaper or a magazine, it's very difficult to read. And we're going to see an example of that here. So uh, I, um, after I edit all day on the computer, I prefer to listen to audiobooks. And I discovered that there's these people who have English video books, and they put the book there, and then they read the audiobook. So this is one way to read and learn to read, I guess, in English. But this is the actual novel. These people have really thought about teaching people. Because look at this. So easy to read those words. So the, the reader reads it. You're never going to lose your place on this page because it's just short and easy. This is much more readable. So clear, organized headings. So invest some time making sure that your headings make clear sense, contain no acronyms. That's another problem I often have with engineers and scientists. They, they put the acronym in the heading because they say, oh, I already defined it earlier in this document. Well, yes, but people will use your table of contents to orient themselves for the roadmap for your report. You cannot put the acronym in the report because the headings are gonna be what they read first. So, a really interesting exercise when I was working on my courses, I found these government reports that were missing 25 pages of each report. And they propagated that error through 12 or 15 years of doing the report. And nobody actually went and redid the table of contents. So the table of contents doesn't make any sense. And, and yet everybody who goes to look for that report is reading that table of contents. And you miss out 25 pages of content because you don't have the headers. It's fascinating. So headings is what produces the table of contents and that gives the roadmap for the document. So it's important to pay attention to the headings. And then here we have another example of headings, okay, making the roadmap. So this is a newspaper from 1919. This oh. is a couple of days before the Spanish flu came to my hometown in Canada. <laughs> and so it's interesting to see what people, you know, focused on that and yet this is readable. This is what people used to read. And so there's five things on this page that make it readable. So try to see if you can see what those five things are. You can write them in the chat if you want, or I'll have the answer key in a minute. I did tell you all the answers already in this presentation, so. Yes, headings are, are one of the, the things. You can easily decide what you want to read because of headings. That's true. Yeah, the different news blocks in different fonts. It's not something that we would do, do now, but it, it does help it. And the font size, and they use a very readable font. Yes. See what else I had. So narrow columns also. <clears throat> Imagine if we took these articles and they went from the left side to the right side. 
imagine trying to read that. It would be ridiculous, right? The reason that you can read this is because it's in narrow columns. And also, surprisingly, for how many words are here, there's actually quite a lot of white space. And look, there we have beautiful indented paragraphs from the old style. So they create the white space by putting those indents. Um, and they create white space just with returns and a few short little lines. So you can do a lot when you know the technologies to use. So now maybe if anybody has questions, we'll pause for some questions or we'll do, I think I have three worked examples still to do. Uh, is line spacing also different for different articles? You mean on that page? Yes, it was. <clears throat> no questions yet? Yes. Am yeah, Krista, somebody Krista, has a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Krista, there was a uh, comment by uh, Mr. Yatin Joshi about fonts when you mentioned fonts. Uh -huh. so he, he had written whether you have tried Georgia and Sitka, these two fonts. Uh, so Georgia is a serif font. Um, it can be, it's similar to Times New Roman. And I'm not sure for Sitka, I don't think I've seen that one. But yes, it, Georgia is similar to Times New Roman. I just know Georgia is for some reason not considered quite as good as Times New Roman for publishers, but it's certainly used quite commonly too. Yeah. I just wanted to give a few foolproof examples. Oh, the, that you the, cannot point is, the point is that uh, Times New Roman was designed for the print medium for the newspaper, where mm -hmm. Georgia or Sitka or other fonts which are coming now are were specifically designed to be read on screen. That's the difference. So how do you spell Sitka? How do you spell that? S-I-T-K-A. Oh, like the spruce. I'll yeah. have to look In it fact, up. it was a collaboration between uh, Kevin Larson of Microsoft Group and Matthew Carter, who is a renowned type designer. And they went on testing different versions, and finally they uh, added Sitka. If you have Windows 8.1 or later, you will have Sitka on your system. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, Thank I've you. used to Sitka, OK? Maybe for a year, I tried Sitka, and then I changed to something else. It starts with S. I don't I remember offhand. That's what I use right now. I, I don't know what prompted me to change, uh, mm -hmm. move away from Sitka. I, I did use it for almost a year. Well, it looks a little old fashioned. Oh, and somebody says the New York Times has switched from Times New Roman font to Georgia font now. Well, there you go. <laughs> In fact, Georgia was a, one of the earliest fonts to be designed specifically for screen. Yes, and somebody else had mentioned Garamont and Dido, and I saw it, but I was talking at the time and I didn't stop to, to comment. So thank you for mentioning those. Oh, I use uh, and somebody says, where would the heavy ornate words go if we didn't use them in writing? Maybe they find a place in fiction. I mean, <laughs> yes. I, and I think that's the beautiful thing about fiction is a lot of people go to fiction to enjoy words. And so we don't want to make it all gray. I think in fiction, we can add colorful <laughs> words and more interesting words. And it's okay for fiction readers to go to the dictionary. That's part of the joy of reading fiction is to go to the dictionary and learn a new word. But if you want somebody to be understanding some research, they're already tired and not having a lot of fun, probably. So uh, footnotes versus explanation in the main text, which one is more readable in general? Uh, I think that one's a content choice. If you use footnotes or you explain something in the text, uh, I mean, it depends on your context completely. Just out of curiosity, can one actually make a living by drafting emails for other people? Sure, if you get the right clients. You can make money doing all kinds of things if somebody offers to pay you. It's amazing. <laughs> so we'll try this example. You can feel free to keep putting things in the chat if you want to. So I, I have actually seen people write something like this for a safety document. So the first thing that's wrong with that is the font was not readable. And the other thing was there was no white space. So when I have something that somebody shows me like that, the first thing I do is I put a return after each sentence just so I can see what the sentences are. Just by putting these returns, you're automatically making it more able to more readable. 
So after I put those returns, I can see that three of those points are about ice. Uh, one of them says situational awareness and then vehicles. So I guess they're talking about awareness of vehicles. And then they discuss uh, working underwater. And on the Gabu site, there was no underwaterness. And so this was a case of people in the company copying previous work from the company and not even editing. Just like I told you about that government department that didn't redo the table of contents. Okay. People, people in companies need to check what they're writing down. Um, and then they're talking about presenting a strong posture uh, against muggers, and then they repeat themselves as well. So this is a, a big jumble. So there's a guy named Klaus Hopper. He was a German guy, um, and he uh, specialized in industrial safety and airplane safety and stuff. And he came up with this uh, format, which he calls the question, for question answer format. So somebody who wants to do safety at the Gabu site, they might say, what do I do about ICE? That's the question on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, we have three answers. Salt the areas that get icy. I know in India, you have so much ice. So I wanted to give you this example. So <laughs> then also give uh, visitors, we have these devices with steel spikes on the bottom that people can put on their boots on icy sites. And you can put handrails along icy paths. Ice is terribly dangerous. You know, People think winter is romantic. It's not. It's just painful. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, and then situational awareness, they had two points. So be vigilant for vehicles and prevent, present a strong posture and determined gaze to deter muggers. So we took all those words and we made much shorter and easy to check off that we did these things. Yes. Now, if people are writing some more things, justified and not justified. Uh, so people said, should we use ornate, uh, ornate fonts in children's books? Uh, should we just make it that people can speak out loud? Would people prefer that, Vivek? Do you think? Instead of putting in the chat or? Yeah, we can do that at the end. Okay. Should I do another worked example or because we have only five minutes left on the hour, should we do that to finish the questions now and then I can do the next example? Uh, maybe we if, so, if anybody has to leave. Maybe you can take up this example, the fire safety one, and then we can have the questions. Okay. okay. So uh, what's wrong with this fire safety notice? Again, it has the same problem as the last one, is that the format is off. It also doesn't even use punctuation. This is all one sentence. Um, however, again, in companies, people just think somebody says, oh, you have to write a safety notice, and then they go and write it, but they don't really think about it. And then the fire happens, and the first problem is this, panicked people don't read. Panicked people don't read, so they will not be able to access this at all. And they're probably not going to read this when they're not panicked, right? Because it's not even intriguing to read. So secondly, there's distracting formatting, hyphens, dashes, and run-on sentences, even if they were able to read. And it has irrelevant information for the user. So you see down here, the unobstructed vertical, so it says, do not use the elevators or you may end up trapped between floors if the electrical power is cut off. Uh, the unobstructed vertical shaft attracts heat and smoke like a natural chimney. So they're giving us a lesson about how elevators work. <laughs> you know, you don't need a lesson about elevators during <laughs> fire. <laughs> so, so here, again, let's do the question answer thing. It's not in the same format. It's in a bullet list, but... Question, what do I do? Answer, these things in this order. Mm -hmm. um, leave the building. So now the one about the elevator is interesting because we have to say, do not use the elevator. But if you tell people what they do not do, you must also tell them what they should do. Again, this is a really bad thing for parenting, right? Everybody's always saying to kids, don't do this, don't do that, don't do... Well, no, you need to say, what do you want them to do? Okay, so use the stairs. Gather outside. Notify the switchboard. So we also have to put it in order. In the original one, they said notify the switchboard before you left the building. You know, first get out of the building. So we have to make it simple and we have to word it positively. And then this is kind of my magic uh, little summary list of things that I do quickly. So I break up the paragraphs. I break up the sentences. Uh, make some bulleted lists. Introduce white space, even if that's just adding paragraph returns. 
uh, reduce the trash words, replace the long words. So if you go to my blogs, I have some lists of those words, or if you, if you get the books that I have, then they have longer lists of words. Um, and create diagrams to replace words when you can. And that's all I have to say for today. There's the web address in case you want it. And then we can, people can turn on their cameras and their microphones, I think. That's all, all I have really to say. So people well, can, can now tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> or add some more. I have a question. I can't turn on my camera because of the connectivity issues. But um, since we're looking at editing, you're Canadian, I'm American, uh, much of the audience is in India. Is there, um, where would we go to find out what different countries call the different stages in editing? Like for example, Editors Canada call it structural, stylistic, copy, editing, and proofreading. And this is wonderful about plain language, uh, but I, I would be interested to see what, if there's different ways of referring to um, different points in editing. And I'll unmute so that it's more clear for others. Yeah, come here and ask. There's a meeting full of uh, Indian people can tell, answer that question for us. Yeah, Dr. Venkat, maybe you can answer this. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, there was a question, a similar question that was asked by somebody in EA. Okay, there was a blog written by Louise Hanbe where she talked about five points. And uh, I think, um, it is possible to group all this and then make sense out of it. Only thing is, um, right now, in, if you ask me abruptly, I'm sort of short of words, I would say. Okay, um, can I can I send you a, a link to what I wrote, if you don't mind? Huh? I would love that. I would love okay. that if you could. Um, can you uh, put it in the my... chat so we can all see it? Uh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Uh, not now. Maybe you can just... Uh, uh, put in your email ID there on the chat and I'll send it to you. Hmm? Sure, I will. I'll do that. I mean, there are too many different uh, types of nomenclature there. And then um, it, it can be understood if we look at it very objectively and try to understand what each one stands for and how it is practically relevant in a given situation. Yeah, because not, not all documents require all those different stages yeah, yeah. and not all budgets can deal with all yeah. those different stages. The talk yeah, exactly. of uh, developmental editing, uh, structural editing, line editing, <laughs> style editing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, some of these yeah, words yeah. are very... Uh, I'm sure, yes, and that, I, I, I totally um, agree. And I would love to hear that simply because as an American working with you know, English as a second language editing and also belonging to Editors Canada, it's fascinating how different organizations and countries break down how they see the process. And, and as Krista just said, there's some, I mean, I, I edited a children's book and obviously I did not need the four stages, <laughs> but it's just, it would be interesting to have that as a reference when talking to say a Canadian right. client versus a British client versus a client in India. So thank you very much for that. I put, I sent you my um, email. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely send you the uh, link uh, to the Facebook post, you know, where I explained that. Hmm? Uh, maybe Aisha can, uh, Aisha can answer that from the UK perspective. She has been working with UK clients. Aisha Chari. She's still here. Can you hear me? Yes, she's yes we can hear you, yes. I don't think there's a straightforward answer to that. Um, I find um, most of the processes are called the same. I think it's where co sort of the difference comes where when there's a question of what level of editing one requires to do and everyone's talking about whether it's copy editing or line editing. Um, and I think that's basically where the difference is. Yeah, yeah like I would much. say structural and developmental editing are basically the same also, and then line editing and copy editing. But I think uh, being here in the UK, um, I find everyone understands what copy editing is. I think in America, they tend to use line editing. And there's some overlap with 
sort of heavier substantive editing um but it's it's sort of a very very gray area i don't think there's a clear line saying this is copy editing and this is line editing and this is substantive editing um in stm those who edit stm will be familiar with the different levels of editing i think this was created by um not necessarily by publishers but just by um the teams managing publication um processes just to help them understand internally what level of editing they were expecting uh copy editors to do and i think that's what's in some sense created what no one is very clear about um but in general i think copy editing proofreading um and typesetting is sort of the three main areas that that are pre publication officially i don't know if that helps at all that helped a lot thank you aisha that's that gave me a good overview and i do realize that you know there is a lot of overlap between one versus the other but um i just wanted to to see if if you were familiar with that and uh with the labeling process and like you say it is a labeling process so thank you very much for that yeah tindra added another good point too which i didn't mention which is uh justified if you justify the text it's less readable because it makes um too much space in between some words and then it creates rivers of space um so it actually distracts the eye because it uh, all the same problem can happen if people put um double spaces after a period the word <laughs> often increases those spaces and so when you have those people who insist on double spaces after a period i usually tell them to that the thing is we now have software it's good to have double spaces on a typewriter but if you're using a computer designed to only use the single space for that same rivers of space i i'm surprised why that question comes up you know so often it comes up again and again and again <laughs> because people learn naturally from their grandparents you know and that's a good thing that the <laughs> does somebody have some other points about readability or uh somebody says use symbols instead but i don't know what they wanted to use symbols for symbols are good unless people uh, don't know hi. what the symbol is yes yes but hi krista uh i uh Uh, I, I was. Uh, I wanted to ask this question when you were uh, explaining that thing about reducing the garbage words and uh, reducing the wordiness. I think mm -hmm. that's uh, that's a crime. All all academic writing is guilty of. All academic writers are guilty of that crime because, uh, like you said, the 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 younger writers they have this. Um, they just have this tendency to exaggerate whatever idea that. trying to convey and in that they try to use the biggest words they can find to describe whatever they have found in their data data analysis or describing whatever they want to describe and and as a, an academic coming from the indian context we have always been discouraged to use the first person like you said uh, we lose accountability when uh, yeah we have always been discouraged it it seems like we are trying to make a very informal statement and kind of uh reduces the formality of that whole uh research process coming to a conclusion and the presentation of that so the 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 passive voice has always been encouraged as a more official and a formal way uh yeah. of presenting facts and so some so of the how do we deal with that So some of, of the scientific that already that set up. So some of the scientific okay. journals do some of the scientific journals do still insist on passive voice you're right and not using we but more and more of the journals are now allowing active voice and in fact I started a conversation on the European Association of Science Editors about this last month um and said how many of you still insist on passive voice none of them would admit it they <laughs> some of them said oh i think another journal might do that but we don't do that anymore so uh and before i had that conversation i somebody else had told me maybe some of the british journals still insist on third person 
but more and more of the American journals are more for clarity and straightforward writing. So I think sometimes we have to go back in and double check the guidelines to see if it's as formal. And I think it's in the same realm of two spaces after a period. Like, as you say, we were taught this. And even 10, 20 years ago, it was very much more that um, than now. But I, I think also there is always the thing of, you know, Americans have always tried to write most clearly as possible and they throw away the old rules mm -hmm. more quickly. Um, but I think sure. you're right that in some cases, people will still insist on the old way and you're not going to change their mind. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Did that answer yeah. your question? Also, because in the academic... Yes, I think you did, but uh, it more or less <laughs> remains on what I already know as in, like Indian English already follows the kind of it's like we've inherited the UK context in, in the use of English language. So I think we still adhere to those, to those norms. So I think even if we try to simplify it, like you've said, but I think we've got, I think this is just my opinion. I'm, I, I would love the comments from all the experts gathered here that we kind of have to tread a middle ground wherein I keep my accountability, accountability, academic accountability by, by, with a balance of formality and clarity. And I don't know how to make it, I would like good advice on how to make it clear, but not reduce the seriousness of my conversation and also not make it too light and when I convey the findings. Comment if somebody bottom. have some, some more Indian people can comment on that. Uh, I would be very interested also to hear. There are, there are two things uh, that I can think of, you know. Uh, one is I keep teaching, telling my students off and on one point here. Um, when your thought process is right, okay, when your thought process is right, the sentence falls into place. Okay, and that's a very difficult thing, okay, number <laughs> one. And someone else said, do not begin a sentence without knowing how it is going to end, okay? <laughs> Again, you understand what I'm trying to say there, okay? I mean, this is not my thought, something I read somewhere else. Do not begin a sentence without knowing how it's going to end. And part of the, part of the problem we have with writing is, is all this. And then with regard to active and passive voice and use of uh, formal, I mean, using I and all that, okay? Look at what you want to say. Again, coming, it, it boils down to uh, being clear about what you want, your thought process, basically. What do you want to say? Uh, if that part is clear, I think the, the difficulty relating to active and passive voice will automatically t be taken care of. These are uh, my thoughts. Hmm? Okay. Somebody else also? Oh, they are too shy to answer your question. So the people who are editing in India, do you, do you find you can use the active voice then or are you using the passive voice more? Mr. Joshi, any comments from you on this? Depends on the journal to which you are writing for. As Krista said, some journals are okay with it, some are not. So it depends on that. Yeah, I think I have to follow that uh, part where she said, you have to know where your reader is coming from. So who is my reader? Who is my audience? My primary audience, the first, before it percolates down to others. But, you know, also check the guidelines because sometimes I have the prof saying, oh, no, I can't use we. And then I check the guidelines of the journal and they can use we. So. Yeah. So it depends on the journal, essentially. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thanks. Well, Thank you for asking. It's a good question. Yeah, Krista Mano. It... Yeah, please go on. No, it's so good. Okay. Yeah, Madhavan wants to have some input from you on readability lists. What does that mean, readability lists? Um, 
I guess uh, there are uh, um, readability lists. Uh, I think there's a West readability list, a list of words which can be used at the school level. So are there any modern ones? Are there any new uh, readability lists available? Uh, can you so throw some light on this? Yeah, so it, like educational publishers, in other words, yeah, they, yeah. they have words for each age group that are considered. Correct. And Correct. of course, that's always changing with the generation too, what, what people consider is acceptable for an age group. Uh, I, I don't have my hands on it right now, but if you email me, I know people who would know the most common ones at the moment at least in the US. Again, this will also vary with uh, where you are. So I know, like in Canada, we tend to have a little bit higher level than US usually. And I imagine in Britain also, it's probably a bit higher level of what people are expected to read at age eight or read at age 10 and, and so on. So yeah, I mean, that's what is enjoyable about educational editing is the rules are very clear. And really focused on helping people to understand. So I enjoy that. Yeah. Somebody else? You can always ask a question on LinkedIn in the future. I, I like questions. Does anybody have anything really smart to say before we wrap up? Uh, Krista, uh, this is Ken Shook here. And I'm sorry, I, I'm, uh, I joined the session when I was just back from the gym, so that's why I'd not cringe anybody out by switching on the camera. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a couple of questions. Uh, and I guess the first, uh, when you hear the first question, you, you, you may want to kill me, but resist the temptation. So what are your thoughts on the singular they? Because I've heard so many uh, warring opinions on it that I cannot make one, one of my own. And So okay. now in... Now in Canada, they is very much the thing to use because in Canada, at least, the gender fluidity issue became very important. So mm -hmm. the LGBTQ uh, community, um, some people do not want to be known as he or she. They want to be known as they. And so now it would be sort of considered incorrect to write he slash she like we used to do or he or mm -hmm. she. It's definitely incorrect to write only he, which used to be the normal thing considered correct, but now that's just way too sexist. So using they singular is now actually correct practice. And I would say even that's only one or two years old. That, that. So there's something called the conscious style guide. Um, I think it's conscious, conscious style guide, just like this.com. And so when I asked on... I think I asked the copy editors list uh, in, in the States and I said, I just want one nice little list of what's correct. Because, you know, with educational publishers, they make one nice little list of what's correct for any one project. And the answer I got back from a lot of editors is there is not one list. There's all these web pages and everything's changing all the time. Um, so, for example, though, I have like an Indigenous style guide for Canada. So if you're writing about or interacting with Indigenous people in Canada, you would want to read that book and understand um, but so that's my answer about they. It's a good idea now, I think. Right. How is it in yeah. India? Is that uh, considered? Uh, in I India, always, you know, I yeah. have a safer side. in the gods oh, and goddesses we have in India, we have one type called Ardhanarishwara, half male, half female. Okay. Uh, and that's the only name I know of. If anybody else has got any other name, maybe <laughs> we can add that. <laughs> I, so what I do you write it? Sorry, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to jump in as an Indian who uses they, them pronouns, um, just to uh, provide a little bit of perspective there. Um, the singular they is not a recent issue and it's not a recent addition to the English language. It's been used um, in the past. It's been used by Chaucer. It's been used by Shakespeare. It's been used by Jane Austen. Um, it's only become an issue now with the emergence of uh, transphobia, with the emergence of hatred towards um, and that's for towards trans people. And that's when trans people asked for rights, right? When we asked for our rights, that's when that came in, uh, became an issue. That's point one. Point two, in India, again, transness has not uh, been a political issue till the Bush came in and decided that um, decided to impose their own gender constructions on Indian society, which has always embraced transness in this very unique way. 
So, um, and a lot, there is a lot of conversation to be had. Um, I do wish Indian English used they, them uh, more. Uh, we don't see that. We don't see it being used in academic context. We don't see it being taught in schools and that's an issue. Um, but that's a transition that we need to make as professionals, right? We need to kind of lead that charge in that direction. It's, it's a decolonial practice to do this. Um, and that's something to be aware of. Uh, so that's one side of things. Um, I also want to say that um, we need to um, not make, not think of it as an issue, but think of it as an activist platform, right? This is an activist stance. It's not an issue, right? Issue has a connotation that we need to be careful of as uh, people who work with language. So just throwing that in there. Yeah, those are all very good points. And yeah, so I didn't mean to say we never used they before, but now it's the most common and correct thing now. Um, and another thing that came up as you were talking is that Canadian Indians, of course, now we call them indigenous people. Um, there's a indigenous course, which is really good. And one thing that they point out is gender was never an issue before the British came to Canada either for the indigenous people here. You could be male, you could be female, you could be someone who looked like you're male and choose female tasks. There's a lot of people that are two spirits and two spirit people are kind of acknowledged to be more bigger people than just single spirit people. And so because of that, they're reclaiming their gender identity is not, a. it's again, it's decolonialization. It's not a matter of like, oh, we're now going to find feminism. It's like, no, we're going to return to feminism, which we already had before, or return to gender fluidity, which was never a problem until they imposed British ways. So it's an interesting parallel. Yeah, uh, Kinshuk, you had another uh, uh, query. You said you have two questions. I did, yeah. Uh, Krista, the other question is, uh, so I, I work for uh, clients who publish a lot of content on the internet. It's all, it's all for a web audience. And the audience is not defined geographically. So it's a global audience. Uh, one problem that I've observed, but I've never talked about with the clients is their use of uh, elongated columns. So you talked about a manageable column width because it appeals to the eye to read only a specific number of words in one saccade. Uh, how would you recommend I go about initiating a conversation with my client so that they see the point and uh, feel inclined to change the way they format their content on the internet? Because everybody wins if they do that. So do you mean they're using it too wide? Correct. Uh, yeah, I would just throw some research at them. Uh, I feel like we could find an article about this on the internet, probably about how reduced column width really increases the readability of it. I, I feel sure there's some studies on it. Um, sure. you could probably uh, find on Google. In, in fact, about 65 characters per line is kind of a sweet spot. Yeah, I feel sure that you can find some, some resources. Do you, do you have a link for that, Katin? I can dig up there plenty. There's a lot of work on this. Yeah. No, right. but yeah, so that's what I would do good. for the clients. That's good does, to know. Does Thank not you. depend on the publication type. Yeah, but he's asking specifically for the web. So I'm sure there will be research okay. for the okay. web. Yeah. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you so much, everybody. So do we have any more questions or should we? wrap up the session which has been like very interesting entertaining interactive engrossing no more questions oh well, thank you for having me i really yeah, enjoyed that thanks krista we all thank enjoyed you, krista. the session every bit was enjoyable have a nice evening yeah yeah you too and next session will be our at our usual time of 11 a.m. in the morning, we will be. It will be an informal session on editing courses. So, those who offer editing courses, those who have taken editing courses, both of them are welcome to come and share their inputs, their feedback, what's missing, what more can be added. And for the travel series, we will. Keep on exploring the Himalayas. This time the title is From the Western Himalayas to the Eastern Himalayas. The speaker is Mr. Shahid Khan. So, Krista, I hope you will be able to make it to one of our travel sessions also. 
Yes, me too. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.